In a case of fatigue, confusion, or forgetfulness, using our mnemonic old cards, we note the onset, or when did it start? And like we do with most cases towards the end, and in particular a case of fatigue where our patient may have helpful insight, we can go ahead and ask now why they think their fatigue may have started. For the duration, like we do with all cases, we were interested in knowing if the fatigue is seen constantly throughout the entire day or is it more intermittent in certain settings, for example, at work or towards the end of the day. Next, we can note the progression. Is the fatigue, confusion, or forgetfulness appearing to occur more frequently? Or if there has been no progression, we'll also state that in our patient note to show that we asked. To characterize fatigue, it's important that we do a full and thorough review of symptoms to see if we can find something wrong. And for confusion or forgetfulness, we're going to review our ADLs and IDLs as we'll see below. Aggravating and alleviating factors and treatments tried, such as over-the-counter supplements. And again, if there are no aggravating and alleviating factors or treatments tried, we'll also be sure to state that in our patient note to show that we asked. For all cases, let's order a mental status exam, CBC, serum electrolytes. And to look for reversible causes, we'll add TSH, T4, serum iron ferritin, B12, HIV antibodies, RPR for syphilis, folate, and BUN creatinine. In hypothyroidism, our supporting points include fatigue, weight gain, and cold intolerance. Interestingly, in hyperthyroidism, in a form called apathetic thyrotoxicosis seen particularly in the elderly, we all also have apathy or fatigue, and now with a weight loss and heat intolerance. In iron deficiency anemia, for example, from colorectal or pancreatic cancer, we can see the fatigue and the characteristic weight loss or decreased appetites and night sweats seen in cancers. We'll have constipation in colorectal cancer, or diarrhea with foul and greasy stools in pancreatic cancer. In both, we can have hematochesia with abdominal pain, and our patient will typically have a history of a heavy smoker. In a case of menstruation, we'll have heavy menses as a cause, which helps show the importance of doing a complete and thorough review of symptoms. And we'll add to our workup a colonoscopy, CT of the abdomen, lipase, and amylase. B12 can present as either fatigue or dementia, which again is showing the importance of looking for reversible causes. Subacute combined degeneration affects both the dorsal and the lateral columns. On the dorsal side, in our physical exam, we can note numbness, tingling, a loss of proprioception or vibration. We can also have a positive ataxia and Romberg sign. And on our lateral columns, we'll see motor weakness or a hyperreflexia with increased deep tendon reflexes and a positive Babinski. Our patient will have a history of a vegan diet or a weight loss or bowel surgery. Major depressive disorder appears as a great mimic in the elderly as an atypical dementia, which again is showing the importance of looking and trying to identify reversible causes. Using the mnemonic SIGI caps will have a decreased sleep, decreased interest, feelings of guilt, decreased energy or fatigue, decreased concentration, decreased appetite, and decreased weight in a typical depression or increased appetite and increased weight in an atypical depression, psychomotor agitation, restlessness or restfulness, and suicide ideation. The duration is typically greater than two weeks and we need five out of nine criteria. Siggy caps is eight, the ninth being a depressed mood. And decreased interest or depressed mood is typically one of the five criteria that we need. And in an OSCE, even if we don't have all five, we'll still include it in our differential and we'll add a PHQ-9 and a Beck depression inventory. Obstructive sleep apnea also can be one of our reversible causes, and the onset here is typically correlating to either fatigue or the cognitive impairment, confusion or forgetfulness. With stopping, we'll see snoring, daytime tiredness, observed periods of apnea, high blood pressure, a BMI that's greater than 35, an age that's typically greater than 50, an increase or enlarged neck girth, and a gender that's male, and we'll add a polysomnography. In particular, if we're given fever on our vital signs, we should be concerned for delirium. And if we have a history of a concurrent infection, such as a UTI or pneumonia, or medications such as TCAs or benzodiazepines, HIV or neurosyphilis, if we're given a history of STDs, or folate deficiency, if we have a history of heavy alcohol use. And we'll add an EEG for a case of delirium. In subdural hematoma, we'll see confusion, forgetfulness, 
with a history of falls, head trauma, and anticoagulation, and will order a CT of the head and an MRI of the brain. Mild neurocognitive disorder will have normal ADLs with compensation, the ADLs being given by the death or dressing, eating, ambulating, toileting, and hygiene, and the IDLs by the shaft mnemonic, shopping, housework, accounting, food prep, and transport. The rest of these dementias are listed in decreasing order of prevalence, and Alzheimer's disease will see a decline in the ADLs, an onset that's typically more gradual and that's also progressive. In vascular dementia, we'll have a decline in the ADLs, and it will be a stepwise decline with a severity that's increasing with each stroke. And we could also see neurological symptoms in our physical exam, such as right arm weakness or increased deep tendon reflexes, and our patient will have a history of strokes. In Parkinson's disease, we'll have the decline in ADLs along with a resting tremor, which is different from an essential tremor, which is an action tremor, and it will be aggravated by stress, and we can have positive stiffness or rigidity noted in our review of symptoms, and a shuffling gait seen in our physical exam. In Lewy body dementia, we'll also have the decline in ADLs, with a key word being also hallucinations. And in frontal temporal dementia, or also known as PICS disease, we'll have a decline in ADLs that's rapid and that's very progressive. We'll also see characteristic behavior or personality changes with speech and language problems. And finally, in normal pressure hydrocephalus, we'll see our mnemonic, wet, wabbly, and wacky for urinary incontinence, gait disturbance, and a confusion or forgetfulness. Exam with a hand sanitizer, and we want to ask our SP if we have permission to examine you. Okay, and we'll start with the hint exam. So we'll comment that there's no more cephalic atraumatic. We don't see any lesions. We'll move on to the oral pharynx. So we'll use a tongue depressor here. The key thing to do is you don't want to add too much pressure for the SP. So just very lightly, you can press down and ask them to please stick out your tongue. Okay, and we'll comment that we don't see any uh, lesions. We'll examine his thyroid. And so another good tip is to offer a glass of water. Would you like a glass of water? Okay, and now we could look to see if there's any visible lesions to the thyroid, and we don't see that, so we could ask them to swallow, and we could do one side at a time. Okay, now please swallow again. Okay, we didn't feel any palpable thyroid nodules. And then we can now transition to the cranial nerve exam. For cranial nerves, uh, cranial nerves, uh, one, we don't really assess cranial nerves, so we could kind of use that as a hint or as a placeholder to test their alertness and their awareness. So we could ask them, uh, what is their name? Kalichi. And where are we right now? The clinic. Okay, good. And what time of day is it right now? Afternoon. Good. So now we could see, we could verbalize that they were alert and oriented times three. Now, if this were also a case of confusion or forgetfulness, we want, might want to add a three-item recall. So we could ask them to please memorize the words cat, apple, table. Cat, apple, table. Good. And please remember them at the end of the exam. I'm going to ask you to repeat them. Okay, now we could transition to the rest of the cranial nerve. So for cranial nerve two, ask them to look straight ahead. And we're just going to check their pupillary constrict the response, and then we're going to do the same thing on the other side. We're going to do the same thing here, and then we're going to do it on the other side. Good. Now we could verbalize that they were pearl of pupils recall and reactive. We're going to transition to cranial nerve 3, 4, and 6. So please, you'll instruct them to please follow your fingers with their eyes, keeping their head straight, and you could see that he's able to follow. Okay. Trigeminal nerve, cranial nerve five, and we're going to assess this with sensation. So please uh, close your eyes and let me know if this is equal. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, good. So for cranial nerve seven, we're going to go ahead and ask him to please smile, puff out your cheeks. Okay, don't let me pop them. Close your eyes real tight, don't let me open. Cranial nerve eight, and we'll ask him to please close your eyes and let us know what side you hear this. Left. Okay, you hear this louder on your left? Yeah. Okay, good. So that would be a concern now if he has hearing loss on his right hand side. So continue with cranial nerves 9 and 10, so you could ask him to say, aha, please. Uh, and we would try to stick out your tongue, and we would visualize that we could see a non-deviated uvula. And while he's out here, we could also ask him to do to move his tongue left to right, and we could say that his hypoglossal nerve, cranial nerve 12, is intact. And now we will finish up with the cranial nerve 11, so please shrug your shoulders, okay, so they're equal. And look that way and resist me, okay? And look this way and resist my movement, good. And now we're going to continue with MSRP. So for motor strain, please make a muscle for me. Okay, and resist me. So five out of five, full reflection, and extend five out of five on extension. Great. Now we're going to do sensation to light touch. So please close your eyes, and let me know if you feel this equally on both sides. Yes, I do. Okay. Now we're going to do a pinprick. So please let me know if you feel this. You feel that? 
Okay. Now we're gonna do the same thing on your right. His reflexes. So we're gonna look at his biceps reflex. We'll place our thumb on his biceps tendon, and this would, uh, his normal reflex would produce a two plus response. Okay, and if we were concerned for a case of B12 or hyperreflexia, he would have a three plus response. Okay, you would see that. Uh, now we could uh, assess his radial pulses as well. So we could do one at a time, two at a time if you're more comfortable, and we'll verbalize that it's a two plus pulse, regular rate and rhythm. After we completed the MSRP for his upper extremity, we can now move down to his lower extremity and we could do the same thing. For motor strength on the lower extremities, could you please kick out? Okay, good, so that's five out of five. Now could you please kick in? Good, five out of five. Now we'll go into sensation. So please close your eyes and let me know if you feel this equally on both sides. Yes, I do. Okay, great. And now we're gonna go into pinprick. So this is a pinprick. I'm gonna start on your left side and please let me know if you feel this all the way down. Yes, I feel it. Okay, and now I'm gonna go on to your right side. So please let me know if you feel this. Yes, I do. We would also use this uh, time for sensation for B12 deficiency for neuropathy. He may not uh, have good proprioception. So if we ask him if this is the up position and this is a down position, mm -hmm. where, where are we now? Are we up or down? I don't know. So he may say he doesn't know, and that, that would confirm that he has lost his proprioception for B12. We could instruct him to relax and we'll do a patellar reflex. So a normal patellar reflex would be like 2 plus. And if we were concerned like hyperreflexia or B12, uh, we would get a hyperreflexic response. So just relax, and you'd see something like this. And we can continue to demonstrate with the tap on his Achilles tendon. So we'd start right here, and we would we would get a normal reflex. And if this was a case of B12 and we were concerned about hyperreflexia, he would give us a dramatic uh, response. Okay, and you feel that. We could also test while we're down here a Babinski. So we could start on the bottom of the sole and go into the big toe. And note, if he had a positive Abinsky, his toes would curl up. While we're down here also, we would want to assess his pulses. So his posterior tibial pulse would be behind his uh, medial malleoli. We could confirm that it's a two plus pulse, regular rate and rhythm. Okay, now that we've finished with the lower extremity, we'll go ahead and hand sanitize again. And we'll ask our SP if they could please stand up and take some steps. Turn around, please. Once we're noting, we'll go ahead and listen to the heart sound. The mnemonic we want to use is apartment M225A. That stands for the aortic, so we'll check that aortic first in the second intercostal space on the right. And then we're going to go to the pulmonic side. Tricuspid. And then we're going to go to the mitral. And if this was a female patient, a tip you could use their rest up. We'll start off listening, we'll switch it over to the bell, and we'll use that to listen above the clavicle. And the instructions you want to give is, when you feel my stethoscope, please breathe in and breathe out. <laughs> 